Hello, this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by Christianity Today. Every week, we explore here conversations and questions from a Christian perspective to help you sort out how to live as a follower of Jesus in confusing times. And this week, we have a conversation to seek to do just that. One of the questions that I get quite a bit about my book, Losing Our Religion, is what can be done with what seems to be irreparable generational fractures? And a lot of people are saying to me, at least, you know, it's, it seems to be different than just the, the kind of conflict between hymns and praise songs, say, a generation ago, or the, the natural kinds of you don't understand me generational riffs, that something very different is happening. How do we have a church that goes forward that is able to include multiple generations which by definition from the very beginning from Pentecost on that's what the church has been and there is no life if there's not a generational transfer so how does that happen and that's why I wanted to talk today to Professor Jean Twangy because she's done this research that I think is fascinating about the generational differences I kind of laughed as I read the book at some knowing recognition about some of these uh, differences, but she goes through and explains why. I'm a Gen Xer, and she talks about how we were not as diligently parented as, uh, as maybe the generation before us or the generation after us. We had a lot of independence growing up, most of us. She talks about how where a previous generation would have said, where were you when JFK died? That for Gen Xers, the question is, how old were you when your parents were divorced? And the questions for millennials are very different in terms of the way that they see the world, optimistically or pessimistically, than Gen Z. And so I think sometimes what we do in the church, whether it's in discipleship or in preaching or in evangelism and missions or or whatever, is we tend to think, okay, well, let's learn how to speak to the next generation. When in reality, what we're having to do is to deal with multiple generations at once. How do we talk to those who are above us? How do we talk to those who are below us? And I mean on the timeline only. Those are some really complex questions. And what Professor Twenge is arguing is that they're more complex because of, you guessed it, smartphones. So let's see what she has to say. Where were you when the world stopped turning that September day? That was the song lyric by Alan Jackson talking about September 11th for a generation of people who will always remember where they were, just like a previous generation would have always remembered where they were when they heard that John F. Kennedy was shot. And a generation before that would have remembered when they heard that the Japanese had surrendered or Franklin Roosevelt died. But my next guest says Those aren't really the things that make generations. And I think this has a lot of implications for the future. Jean Twangy is professor of psychology at San Diego State University. Uh, She's the author of many books, including uh, Generations, The Real Differences Between Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X, Boomers, and Silence and What They Mean for America's Future, which is what we will be talking about today. And you can also check out a previous book, iGen, why today's super connected kids are growing up less rebellious, more tolerant, less happy, and completely unprepared for adulthood. Professor Twangy, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. So you, in this book, are making a case about these generational differences that sometimes it seems like the argument is, and I see this a lot within the church, some people who think there are these hard and fast differences between the generations. They can't communicate with each other. They need to be almost in separate kind of subcultures. And then some people will say, ah, that's just, uh, there there are no real uh, differences. It's just some different experiences, but it's basically the same. What's your view? Well, you know, as usual, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Of course, we have plenty in common as human beings in terms of our needs and wants, but there are definitely very 
large and impactful generational differences as well. So, you know, I think most of the time in this area, the disagreements are really over the details. I think pretty much everybody can agree on the big stuff that living now is very different from what it was like to live 200 years ago mm-hmm. or 100 years ago or 50 years ago or even 20 years ago. And thus, that has an impact on how we live our lives and our attitudes and our values. And that's what creates generational differences. So the disagreements tend to be over where to put the birth year cutoffs. Should we group people in you know 15 to 20 year blocks or do it a different way? But those really are details rather than the big picture. There was a an interview with President Obama by I believe it was John Favreau who did the the interview, and and he quoted back to President Obama when he said, "I think it's time for me to pass the baton to a new generation." And he said, "By generation, did you mean the silent generation?" Alluding, of course, to the fact that the current president is eighty years old and his probable opponent. 80 years old, the Senate majority leader, 80 something years old, Speaker of the House until recently, 80 something years old. Why are our leaders so old? There's a number of reasons, but one is simply that we live longer. We live Mm. healthier lives for longer. This is one of the big trends that I discuss in the book that because technology has given us better medical care, that also creates longer lifespans. And when we have a longer lifespan, the whole developmental trajectory slows down. And so that's had an impact across all ages and generations. For young people, it means, you know, teens are not as likely to have a driver's license or a paid job when they're in high school. You know, for young adults, it means they marry later and have children later and settle into their careers later. And for middle-aged people, they look and feel younger than their grandparents and uh, parents did at the same age. And so in politics, That means that we have a lot of leaders, you know, who are senior citizens and they're, you know, not, as that interview pointed out, you know, passing on the reins to to the next generation. And, you know, you could say, well, this is good. This is somebody with a lot of life experience. You know, on the other, Gen X and younger is saying, hey, when is it going to be our turn? And for Gen X, the answer is probably never, right? Potentially. Yeah. yeah, as a small generation wedged between the boomers and the millennials. I remember, I can think about looking around my classroom in elementary school, middle school, high school, and I could find, I don't know how many Stephanie's and Jennifer's and um, Jason's and so forth, the same name repeating itself all over the place. And now there are a lot of Connors and Emmas and Aidens and, and those uh, names. You talk in your book about how the naming of kids actually signals something about generational change. Can you explain that to us? Sure. So, you know, the great thing about this particular data set is anybody can play around with it. So it's the Social Security Administration baby names data data set. You can just put that into Google and go find it. It will show you the popular names for each year of birth for boys and girls. And it will also, if you click the right box, show you the percentage of babies with that name. And so a number of years ago, I started looking at this and realized that the number of children who got popular names, so let's say, you know, names in the top 10 for popularity in their year was declining. So there's an interesting, you know, pattern over time with that because, you know, with baby boomers born in the 40s and 50s, pretty large percentages of kids would get those popular names, especially for boys. It was a fourth or even a third at some points who got just one of those 10 names. And the most popular name, which is often Robert, uh, was a good 5% Hmm. of boys born, you know, in those years. And then those numbers started to decline, where in recent years, it's well less than 10%, it's about 7% who get one of those 10 most popular names. And the number who get one of you know, the most popular name in the year is usually only about 1%. So I think that captures another one of the big trends wrought by technology, which is more individualism, more focus on the self and less on social rules. Because what's the purpose of giving your child a name? Is it so they can fit in? That's mm-hmm. a more collectivistic point of view. And in that case, you give your child a common name. Or is the purpose to help your child stand out? That's a more individualistic value. Hmm. And in that case, 
you probably want to give your child a name that is not as common. Well, why does technology do that? I mean, why does increasing levels of technology push us toward more individualism? For a number of reasons. So overall, you know, technology makes individualism possible because it allows people to be independent. It used to be pretty hard to live alone because household work took so much time and you needed more people to do that. You need to work together as a family to do that. And now that's not as true that we have grocery stores and washing machines and refrigerators and so on. And those labor-saving devices also gave people more leisure time, more time to do things other than just work and survive. And that, I think, also played into individualism because it gave people more time to contemplate you know, their own role, to express themselves, to you know, think ab- about their role in a way that you know, I think about my own grandparents you know, running a dairy farm in the early 20th century did not really have time to think about their own self-esteem or self-expression. I th- have kind of a an argument inside myself sometimes because I have uh, friends who have looked at this who will say, "Yes, there's been this there's this ingraining of the idea of self-esteem, and that has led to all kinds of uh, problems." And I say to myself, I really don't see it when I see so many people who are dealing with self-loathing. Is that really true that we have this increased emphasis on self-esteem as we're going from generation to generation? Well, it is curvilinear, which is why there's definitely room for both of those viewpoints. So if you look at measures of um, self-esteem or thinking that you're above average or measures of narcissism, among, let's say, you know, college students and high school students, which is where we have the most data. Those numbers increased pretty steadily from boomers to Gen Xers to millennials up until, depends on the measure, but roughly, you know, the late 2000s, early 2010s. That's when you start to get the transition from millennials to the next generation to Gen Z, born 1995 to 2012. And at that point, Then self-esteem starts to go down, narcissism goes down, number of people who think that they're above average starts to decline, expectations decline, you know, all of that. So we have really kind of shifted in terms of if you look at teens and young adults, what's the primary psychological issue? And for millennials, it was narcissism because that's self-esteem taken to an extreme in Mm. some ways. For Gen Z, it's the opposite. It's it's low self-esteem, which is linked to depression. And that's where we have the biggest problems for, for Gen Z, that I mean, teen depression doubled between 2011 and 2019, so even before the pandemic. You know, there's a lot of talk about the adolescent mental health crisis that's often put in the same sentence as, oh, it's because of the pandemic. It started eight years before the pandemic. And that's clinical level depression that really requires treatment. So these are serious issues. Why is it that there are certain social pathologies that seem to show up in much greater numbers? I mean, for instance, I think about cutting years ago. Yeah, self-harm. When I was, yes, self-harm. But, but particularly, there were large numbers of particularly girls uh, that I would be uh, seeing their parents and would, would bring their young adolescent girls in who were cutting themselves. And then... It just seemed to not happen. I mean, it, it still happens, but it, it wasn't the same kind of seeming epidemic. Why do those things tend to ebb and flow like that? Well, with self-harm, it really hasn't gone away. In fact, it's the opposite. And we have national data on this. The CDC keeps track of emergency room admissions for self-harm. And among 10 to 14-year-old girls, that rate quadrupled hmm. between 2009 and 2020. So that's that's still a very serious issue, and it has gotten worse. So is it worse for girls than for boys, the depression um, issue? Cutting behavior and, and, and self-esteem, yes, is, is worse. And then for some measures of mental health, the increases have been larger for girls than, than for boys. Some measures of depression and loneliness, for example, rose more among girls than among boys. Why do you as, think a gen- that is- as a general rule, girls and young women suffer from self-harm and depression at higher rates. So it's not COVID that led to this this boom in, in depression. What do you think it is? It's smartphones and social media. That's what changed in the early 2010s in the lives of teens. So the end of 2012 is the first time the majority of Americans owned a smartphone. It's also around the time that social media use among teens moved from 
being optional, something you could do or not do, to be virtually mandatory because 75, 80% or so of teens were using social media every day. It's also around the time smartphones got front-facing cameras. Facebook bought Instagram. You know, the character of social media changed around that time as well. And that coincided with teens spending a lot less time with their friends face-to-face and less time sleeping. Hmm. So you put that together, you start spending a lot more time online, on your phone, on social media, less time with friends face-to-face and less time sleeping. And that's a terrible formula for mental health. I imagine there are a lot of teens, young adults, and parents of teens and young adults who are thinking right now, what do I do? Because it, it, it's kind of like a concern over uh, climate change. I, I may be very concerned about it, but what do I, what do, I do <laughs> when I can't do anything to control the uh, carbon emissions of the world? What can a teen, a young adult, a parent, a church do when everywhere is smartphone empowered right now. Well, it is true that we do need group level solutions to this, policy solutions, you know, kind of similar to climate change that, for example, I and many other experts are advocating for the minimum age to have a social media account to be raised to 16 and for age actually to be enforced. Given that the increases in self-harm have been the largest among the youngest and that the links to depression with social media use are also the largest among children and younger teens, that would probably do the most good. And then it would also make it less of a struggle for parents and teens because if nobody has social media among 14 and 15 year olds, say, or even more so among 11 year olds, then you can't make the argument of like, oh, I have to do it to fit in, or mom, everybody else has an account. You know, it would take that argument off the table. I think that's why it would be so powerful. But we don't have that yet. Some states are trying to pass that. Utah has passed that. It just hasn't gotten into effect yet. I think Arkansas has as well. And they're trying to get this passed at a national level. But before then, it's true. You know, then parents and teens have to think about how to manage this. So one thing, if you're a parent with younger kids, put off getting a smartphone for your kid as long as possible. And if they do need a phone, get them a flip phone or get them a gab phone where you can only text and call because then doesn't have internet, doesn't have social media. It's just like one less avenue, you know, where they can use the screen or, or, you know, open a social media account without your knowing. I mean, this is the problem. Kids can open a social media account without their parents even knowing. Parental permission isn't required. It's kind of a mess. You know, at the moment, it's really, really unregulated. And, you know, if you have an older kid, maybe already has that smartphone, maybe already has social media, just put parental controls on that phone. So they're not spending six hours a day on TikTok. Give Mm -hmm. them a limit of a half hour a day, an hour a day, something reasonable like that, where then it's not taking over their lives. And maybe set limits for night, the sleep issue that you brought up. That's a huge one. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that phone or at least very least, you know, social media apps can't be accessed when they're supposed to be sleeping. The device, get it physically out of the bedroom. It has to be downstairs on a charger at night, say, after they go to sleep. So there's not the temptation to stay up late using it or look at it in the middle of the night. With this mental health situation, and you you mention it and talk about it quite extensively in your book, why is it that progressives tend to have more mental health problems than conservatives do, the the left than the right right now. Yeah, so this is an interesting finding. It's gotten a lot of attention over the last few months. It was first found with adults, but it also appears among teens that if you look at the rise in symptoms of depression, it goes up for both liberal teens and conservative teens, but the increase is larger, substantially larger for liberal teens. So there's been a bunch of theories that have been suggested as to why this might be the case. But in the analyses for for generations for the new book, I really kind of, I dialed into looking, you know, more deeply at that question of in-person social interaction and social media use. And that may explain a good amount of that difference, that it turns out liberal teens spend more time on social media than conservative teens, even if you take gender out of the equation and you're looking you know, within gender. Is that because they have parents who are the conservative teens, the parents are restricting it? Is, I'm or, not or sure. Or do they just choose? Yeah, sure. I'm not sure you know, what the reason is. So it, yeah, it could be that parents restrict it more. It could be some other factor. The other thing is liberal teens now spend less time with their friends face to face too. And that didn't used to be the case. Those lines cross. It used to be liberal teens went out with their friends more than conservative teens. And then again, around 2012 or so, those lines cross. So now it's liberal teens spending more time on social media, less time with friends in person. 
which again, isn't a good formula for mental health. I have a friend, Sky Jathani, who uh, would talk about the what he called the license to license problem in church life, which is that there was always this expectation that the time between when someone received a driver's license and a marriage license is when they tended to drift away from church community. And then after they got married and started having children, they usually came back. And his point is that assumed a rather short license to license uh, span. And right now we have this huge time period between those licenses, if the second one happens at all. What are the implications, do you think, for the way that we're reconceiving marriage in the society? It's true. You know, that gap's now about 12 years because the median age at first marriage is around 28. So there's that big amount of time when teens and young adults are taking to explore things. So psychologists start calling that emerging adulthood. And it's not something that, say, even boomers experience, that there's just that longer time during young adulthood before people set in, settle into marriages and careers and so on. And you can really see this with millennials, especially around religion, because that was the thinking for a really long time, that for millennials, okay, you know, they're not as religious as teens and young adults, but once they start getting married and having kids, they're going to come back to religion. And that hasn't happened. And the oldest millennials are now 43. Mm-hmm. So, some of those theories around religion and what was going to happen with millennials just didn't come to fruition. But you think that these are connected, the fact that you you would have had in previous generations getting the driver's license was a huge rite of passage that everyone thought about. And now, at least in my experience, a lot of adolescents yeah, wait around, do their uh, driver's license test when they need to, but aren't really that excited about it. That delay in emerging adulthood, is is that how they connect? That slow life strategy just shows up at at every stage. And so for high school students where it shows up, is it just not as many high school students, even by the end of senior year, have a driver's license. Fewer are working at a paid job. Fewer are going out on dates. Fewer have tried alcohol. So You know, sometimes when people see these, they immediately go to, oh, but isn't that good? Well, maybe, but not all of these trends are are either good or bad. You know, you have to set that aside for a minute and focus on what does this mean for how quickly or slowly kids and teens are growing up? And that's what all of those have in common. Those are all activities that adults do and children don't. And that developmental trajectory has slowed down. Eighth graders are less likely to do those things too. It used to be the majority of eighth graders will have tried alcohol by the end of eighth grade. And now it's only about 25% who have done that. So those norms have really, really changed in a way that has benefits, but then also has some downsides in that, especially once you get to those, the high school seniors there, they're graduating from high school just without as much real world life experience and without as much experience with independence and with decision making. And then they go off to college or to the workplace And that's really hard. It's a really tough adjustment because they have not had those independent experiences as much as previous generations did by 18. The assumption usually from an older generation to a younger generation is that the next generation is uh, is more sexually loosed. And that's not really true right now, right? It's not. Yeah. So for for a while, that's certainly the way that the trend lines are going. But in the past 10 to 15 years, fewer high school students are having sex than in the previous years. It's gone continually down. What do you think is the reason for the fact right now I'm dealing constantly with people who are dealing with young men who are being radicalized by figures such as Andrew Tate, sometimes even by literal neo-Nazi groups and everything uh, in between. When it comes to a violent, sometimes misogynistic, uh, sometimes racist form of masculinity, why do you think that seems to be happening so much more and boys seem to be lost in some ways? Well, there's a lot of speculation on this, and I, it's, it's hard for me to you know, answer it in a direct way you know, with the data that I work with. 
But certainly, a lot of people feel a lack of meaning and purpose the way we live now. And I think that that may be particularly true for, for young men, that so many cultures have traditions of rites of passage for young men. And it wasn't that long ago when that rite of passage might have been join the military. And mm-hmm. now that's a less common path. Or it may have been you get married relatively young, and then you support the family. And now with marriage being pushed so much later, that's not the standard either for for young men. So there's there's a lot of that search for meaning and where people are finding that in one way or another is usually online. And just because of the way online cultures work, they often pull toward the extremes. And so that's where it's ended up for a lot of young men. So would you expect this trajectory that we're seeing right now of females uh, moving left and males moving right generationally, should we, is that an anomaly or should we expect that to continue? It very well might continue. I mean, it, it depends, of course, on, on how each of the political ideologies focus. But at the moment, that's certainly how it, how it breaks down, even among teens, which is interesting. So you might expect, oh, for, you know, older people, for men and women, that you're going to get that, that split. But it, it shows up among high school seniors as well, that the girls are more likely to identify as as liberal and the boys as conservative. And you don't buy the idea that people naturally start out more progressive and become more politically conservative as they age. Well, I do. And that definitely shows up in in the data as well. Boomers definitely did that. Mm -hmm. Boomers are very progressive as young people. And then you know, at least on average, tilted more toward conservatism. Even some folks who, you know, are at the forefront of fighting for civil rights came under, you know, that that rubric. So Ruth Bader Ginsburg, for example, is a pioneer for women's rights, yet she in twenty sixteen expressed some skepticism about Colin Kaepernick kneeling for the national anthem. It's an example of older people who might say, you know, well, we fought for these rights, but we got them, and that's enough change. There are a lot of people who wonder how generationally are we going to see the transgender uh, question? I mean, there's an argument that the rise, very sharp rise uh, in LGBTQ uh, adolescents, that that's simply because there's more social acceptance uh, now. And so it's not really more people experiencing this. It's just more people that we know about. And there are other people who will say some of the gender debate questioning the use of uh, uh, binary pronouns and so forth is, is going to go too far and then tip back to the center. How should we think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one, one thing, given that I write about generations, that is really striking is the generational divide around some of these issues and even the language that's that's used. So for a lot of Gen Z, they have friends who are non-binary and transgender, and they are very comfortable with asking people what their pronouns are and with you know using all the language in this area. So for example, there's a term for folks who are non-binary to call them NB. So N, B for non-binary, and then just the phonetic of that. And there's a lot of Gen X parents whose kids use that, and they're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. It's like we're speaking a different language. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's definitely been that change. And just, you know, to put it in context, if you look on some of the big surveys, there has been a substantial increase in the number of young adults in particular identifying as transgender and identifying as non-binary. And there's also been an increase, um, particularly among women, in identifying as bisexual. There's been smaller shifts in those identifying as gay or lesbian. So it's not completely across the board. You know, we talk about LGBT, but there's differences, you know, within each of those letters in terms of some of the trends. And when it comes to religion, what do you expect to happen, say, if we look at a typical evangelical church 10 years from now? Uh, what could we expect to see generationally? It's a little hard to predict, although the way the trends are going, it 
does suggest that young adults, so that's that's Gen Z, you know, the oldest of whom are, are 28. Ten years from now, the oldest will be 38. So they're going to be that core of younger adults, and they are considerably less religious than previous generations. Now, whether that's going to change, you know, that was predicted that would change for millennials once they started having children, and it did not. And that makes me think it also won't change for Gen Z. But anybody's guess. So how would you advise a community? I mean, a a lot of people that listen to this uh, show are in church communities and they're thinking, how do we think about communicating with one another in mentoring relationships or or just in, in serving together? How should you try to bridge those gaps between Gen Xers and Millennials and Millennials and Gen Z in order to actually be in community together? Like a lot of things, it really begins with empathy of trying to understand someone else's perspective. And you know that was really my goal in this book was to help the generations understand each other better and to, to know the way this person grew up might be different than the way that you grew up, whether that person's younger or older than yourself. And just trying to take that perspective to an extent and realize just because it's different doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad and they grew up in it in a different way. And yes, there are differences in communication styles and language and viewpoints and, and all of those things. But I do think in our current cultural moment, there is also a real yearning for meaning and for purpose and for community and for fellowship because, you know, the internet is not good at those things. Mm-hmm. And it's almost become a replacement in so many ways for that face-to-face social interaction, for, you know, core values. But it doesn't do a good job of that in the long run. Think about church and religion, but also at the same time, political institutions and social institutions, almost every institution seems to be in crisis. I mean, that's not sustainable long term. Some of those institutions may fall, but all institutions can't fall? Or or can they? I mean, do do you think that the technology is moving in such a way that generationally it's just not easy to recover institutions? Or do you think it will just mean the building of of new and different institutions? That's the question. So that was something I thought about a lot in writing this book, particularly around Gen Z and their viewpoints. Perhaps because rates of depression are so high. Depression isn't just about emotion, it's about cognition. And Gen Z is very pessimistic. They are you know, more likely to say that they don't have hope for the world. They are more likely to have lower expectations for themselves. They're more likely to have what's called an external locus of control, like saying things like, well, every time I try to get ahead, something or someone stops me. That's 18-year-olds more likely to say that now than they used to be. And in polls, they are more likely to say America is not a fair society that significant changes to American government are going to be necessary. So, you know, I think there's a chance there's going to be a real reckoning in the next five to 10 years over some of these issues. And it could go a number of ways, you know, pessimism and negativity. If that is channeled into constructive change, that could be a very good thing. But if it's the idea of we just need to tear all the institutions down and start over, I think a lot of people would not be good with that solution. A lot of older people maybe in particular. So that I think is the fear that it will be generational warfare and the younger people all want to just say, let's change everything. And older generations will say, I don't, I don't think that's the best way to do things here. And because institutions by the very nature, take more than one generation to to build and to to join. Just simply recreating all of them at once hasn't worked yet. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Professor Jean Twangy, the book is called Generations, The Real Differences Between Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X, Boomers and Silence and what they mean for America's future. Really fascinating book and will help you as you attempt to navigate some of these questions in your family or in your church. Professor Twangy, thanks for joining us. Thank you. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Host, 
Russell Moore, producer, Ashley Hales, associate producers, Abby Perry and Azure Phelps. Director of operations for CT Media is Matt Stevens. Audio engineering provided by Resonate Recording. Video producer, Abby Egan. And the theme song for the Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hutton.